Thank you, Cynthia. Good afternoon. So my talk is on ectasia risk assessment. I'm very honored to be collaborator for Oculus for many years. This is my financial disclosure. This is my group in Rio and in Brazil that I work. And when we talk about ectasia, we have to think about the first description of ectasia in 1998. The first three cases with high myopia treated that develop ectasia. And later on, the, fur, the case with foam fruit keratoconus, so-called foam fruit keratoconus that develop ectasia after LASIK. We have learned a lot from ectasia risk score system that when you think about the specificity of 91% and the sensitivity of 96 dropping to 92%, even though when we add age, we don't have a perfect system. So we are closer to get better when we have age and we understand topography better. But what we're trying to understand is that any cornea can develop ectasia based on the impact from the procedure, eye rubbing, and cornea resistance. It's very important that we understand that if you want to screen out for ectasia, tell the patient not to rub the eye. That's the first very important thing that you should do so that the patients will not develop ectasia. And it's part of the campaign that we started in Brazil last year that tell the patient not to rub the eye. But how do we characterize ectasia susceptibility? Of course, we start with topography. I was honored to do my training with Steve Wilson, and this paper was done in conjunction with Dr. Kleiss, that was looking into the importance of topography for screening ectasia. We know that 1% of patients develop uh, and that come for refractive surgery, they have some types of keratoconus or topography irregularities. And of course, topography is enough to get a sensitivity to develop uh, diagnosis of keratoconus in this eye with 2020 best correct vision. However, the fellow eye of the same patient tells the story that topography may not be the most sensitive way of describing the very mild forms of ectasia susceptibility. In a case presentation like that, the patient had LASIK with a very thin flap. PTA was lower than 0.4, as Marconi Santiago published. Residual stromal bed higher than 300, the patient had good vision but had ectasia confirmed a few months after surgery. And when we see a patient like that, this yellow little thing here on the Steve Kleiss absolute scale, a lot of people would say, this is pathognomonic of keratoconus who never had LASIK in this case. So we started a study that was published in 2013 on the variability of subjective classifications. It's very important that we understand this was actually case number six. And we asked many experts to look at the classification first with the 1.5 diopter scale and then with the half diopter scale and use the same random criteria for the classification of topography. Interestingly, the mode was zero for both of the scales, but the, the variability was for zero from three with the first scale and then from zero to four with the second scale. So even experts they would change their classifications among themselves when they change the scales, and we have a huge variability that have to be acknowledged. I remember when we were wrote, writing this uh, editorial together with Brad Brandon that we agree in many ways that we should screen beyond but not over detecting mild cases of ectasia and of course considering topography beyond but not over to characterize ectasia susceptibility. So we need to evolve from topography towards tomography. In this case, when you look at the belly and ambrosial display, you have a D that was yellow and an art max that was very low. And those will be the threshold numbers that I'll tell you. I, should, I still use them today. Another way of looking into the screening is specificity. This was not done at my clinic, but with parts of international cohort that did a LASIK also in 2008 with a thin flap. Patient had a very good thickness had LASIK, had LASIK and stable outcomes for over five years. Actually, I talked to the surgeon, it's over 10 years follow-up now. And the belly and ambrosia that was not even existing at that time, 2008, we started the belly and ambrosia display 2010 with the DDs, and we have a very low uh, number here. So we'll be an enhancing specificity here. So understanding ectasia, it comes with understanding topography. And the problem is that topography is being considered as foam fruit keratoconus as a topographic classification. And we have cases with normal topography and even tomography that in, in this for the, the maps display that are developing ectasia and cases with very irregular tomographies that are in the, in the no ectasia group. So we have to improve our ability. So when we talk about foam fruit keratoconus, there is no consensus. 
is an incomplete form of the disease, is a mild form of the disease, the fellow eyes of the patient with no <laughs> clinical ectasia that has asymmetric ectasia, maybe not keratoconus, and we talk about that in a little bit, but the fact that there's no consensus about it. My way of looking into that is those patients that have form through keratoconus, they are better say that they have high susceptibility for ectasia progression. And the ectasia conundrum comes to 20 years now. And there was a very good study done from Europe on the incidence of ectasia, actually the very low incidence of ectasia that you have over a very large series of lazy cases. But when you see the 10 cases of ectasia, you have very low ability to detect, to predict ectasia based on the standard classifications, including PTA and including posterior elevation. So we have to go and do something better. We have been collecting cases that had ectasia with a pre-op of pentacam, and we have a stable group, a large stable group, and 105 cases, and you see that age, PTA, and the residual stromal bed, they don't tell you the story when you have ectasia or not. When you look at the data from curvature IS, the absolute IS, bad D, you have a better way of understanding, but still with a sensitivity that's not so high. So we develop an algorithm with the, called the, P, the Pentacam Random Forest Index, the PRFI, that does a little better to improve the sensitivity to detect ectasia susceptibility before surgery, but it's not enough. So we have to combine that with the data, and that's the work we've been doing with the brain group back in Brazil, and this is considering also age and parameters from the surgery. So we have developed the algorithm on the enhanced ectasia susceptibility score, and we still have some cases here that are not being picked up of the, of the algorithm, but we have a very good specificity and sensitivity that is better than anything I have tried before. So it tells us that we have to go beyond, always beyond, but not over. That's when we come to the biomechanical properties. So we started looking at the dynamic shine fluke imaging back in 2009, and we have here a keratoconic and a normal cornea, and this has to be translated into numbers. And when you talk about the numbers, you have many of the parameters, the deformation amplitude, the velocity, the inverse concave radius, the EDA ratio, and this has to be translated into a parameter. And I was very happy and honored to collaborate with Paolo and Ricardo Minchiguera on the CBI, which gives us a summary. And it gets even better now because we are able to detect ectasia after surgery as well. So our goal is to define objective metrics and eventually combining shape and biomechanics. And this comes with a thesis from Bernardo Lopez on the understanding of the parameters that we have. And we have here tom tomographic and biomechanical parameters, but we can add wavefront, AXL, epithelial mapping. This is something that you have to be looking into objective metrics with topometric and tomographic and also biomechanics. So we came with a population. We have to understand the population. If you try to develop a way of detecting keratoconus, you'll be very good with topography, but how you define keratoconus, that's very important. So that we, we have objective criteria to say that this fellow eyes were normal based on KISA, IS, Central K, and no pattern detected on the TKC, on the pentacam, and, and the keratograph. So these populations will be looked into the objective parameters looking at the ROC curves, and we are going to use AI. AI the best way was the random forest with the leave one out cross validation so that we have the TBI, which is the integration of tomography and biomechanics. And you see that you, you have a different threshold for detecting the clinical cases, the one eye randomly selected for keratoconus and the fellow eye with ectasia that was not treated by any surgery from these 94 patients with asymmetric disease. So this is what we call as a threshold for, sensitive, for ectasia sus, uh, susceptibility. For the implementation, we have to look at external validation studies we've done in India, we've done in Iran, and we have done very nice studies. And eventually, when we get cases like that with a low TBI in a patient that, and you look at the data, maybe this is classified as keratoconus and not, may not be a true keratoconus, more into the ectase, and we are still learning how to understand this data. And in Rio, we have an external validation based on our population that was not seen in the training platform, and you have some false negatives and some other cases with true unilateral ectasia. This was uh, awarded last year in the Joseph Colon Award by my colleague uh, Jorge Haddad, that is the first 
use of the integration. And when we see cases like that, this patient was published in 2010. The patient had LASIK in the left eye, had no surgery, and the right in the right eye. And ectasia happened only in the left eye. So we published the ORA data and the Pentacam data back a while ago. And looking at the stable eye, still stable with the 2015 distance correct vision on the topography, on tomography is not that abnormal. The D is still on the white side, is not even yellow. The PRFI is 0 0.19, but when we integrate tomography and biomechanics, you have TBI of 0 0.78. And we have seen other cases exactly like that. So we have to understand that screen for ectasia risk goes beyond. And we have multimodal imaging. It's even better now because we have, uh, along with axial length, we have wavefront, and that data may help us tremendously to improve our sensitivity and specificity. But we need more and more artificial intelligence that is here to help us in our side to improve characterization of ectasia susceptibility. We should understand more about the impact from surgery. The impact from surgery called the RTA is relational thickness altered. is an algorithm that we have developed that has helped us tremendously to improve the understanding from the PTA, our residual stromal bed into the understanding of the impact from surgery. And this is all going to help us to do better surgery. Thank you very much.